Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to dis discuss the multiplicative inverse of a complex number. In this topic, we will define the multiplicative inverse of a complex number, and we will derive the formula for this using first the rectangular representation, then the application of the complex conjugate to rationalize the denominator, and finally the polar representation. We will then look at the geometric interpretation and observe some properties. When you rationalize the denominator when the numerator was 1, you were actually finding the real multiplicative inverse of the denominator. For example, here we have 1 over 1 plus 2 root 3. Multiplying by the radical conjugate over that same con radical conjugate, we can use FOIL in the denominator to get the result that this is equal to 2 root 3 minus 1 over 11. By multiplying this by 1 plus 2 root 3, you will see that this is indeed the multiplicative inverse. So 2 root 3 minus 1 over 11 times 1 plus 2 root 3, well we can again apply FOIL, simplify the numerator to get 11 over 11 or 1. Now, to find the multiplicative inverse, we must first see that 0 cannot have a multiplicative inverse. For example, if z is equal to alpha plus beta j, then 0 times z must equal 0. The consequence of this is 0 multiplied by any complex number equals 0 and can therefore never equal 1. Thus, 0 cannot have a multiplicative inverse. Thus, for z to be a, have a multiplicative inverse, at least 1 of alpha or beta must be non-zero. We're going to find the multiplicative inverse of a complex number in three different ways. First, we will look at the rectangular representation approach. Then we will use the complex conjugate to rationalize the denominator. Finally, we'll look at the polar representation approach. So starting with the rectangular representation approach, we will find the inverse explicitly. So if z is equal to alpha plus beta j, then z inverse must be gamma plus delta j with a property that the product of these two must equal 1. Well, let's expand out the product of alpha plus beta j and gamma plus delta j to see this result. Now, if this is true, and these two numbers are indeed equal, this is only possible if the real component of the left-hand side equals the real component of the right-hand side, and the imaginary component of the left-hand side equals the imaginary component of the right-hand side. So consequently, alpha gamma minus beta delta must equal 1, and alpha delta plus beta gamma must equal 0. Note, you may look at this and first think, wait a second, this is a system of nonlinear equations. But it isn't, because alpha and beta are already known, and so there are only two unknowns, gamma and delta. So let's rewrite it in this format. We swapped the two equations and swapped two of the entries. Now, because it's a system of linear equations, we can eliminate. So let's assume that beta is the non-zero value, and so we can add negative alpha over beta times equation 1 onto equation 2. Well, simplifying that slightly, we get this expression here. Next, let's multiply that second equation by negative beta to get rid of the denominator, and then we're going to solve for delta. So doing so, we get that delta is equal to negative beta over beta squared plus alpha squared. All right, we now have this system of two linear equations. We can now use backward substitution to substitute delta back into equation 1. And now 
we can solve for gamma to get the following result. Gamma is equal to alpha over beta squared plus alpha squared, and delta is equal to negative beta over beta squared plus alpha squared. Thus, the multiplicative inverse of z is equal to alpha plus beta j is this expression here. Let's rewrite that slightly. Now, doesn't that look a little bit familiar? Alpha minus beta j? Is that not the complex conjugate of z? And alpha squared plus beta squared? Isn't the square root of alpha squared plus beta squared the absolute value of uh, z? Consequently, alpha squared plus beta squared is the absolute value of z squared. Thus, this formula for the multiplicative inverse is just the complex conjugate of z over the absolute value squared. Homework. Show that this is also true if we first assume that alpha is non-zero. Let's look at some examples applying this formula. If z is equal to 3 plus 4j, then its multiplicative inverse is the complex conjugate 3 minus 4j over the absolute value squared, 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is 25. So we get that the inverse of 3 plus 4j is 0 0.12 minus 0 0.16j. If z is equal to 1 minus 2j, then once again, we have the complex conjugate in the numerator and the absolute value squared in the denominator to get that the inverse is 0 0.2 plus 0.4j. Finally, if z is equal to negative 0.3 minus 0.1j, then once again, we simply calculate the complex conjugate for the numerator and the absolute value squared for the denominator. And expanding that out, we get that the multiplicative inverse is negative 3 plus j. Let's take a different approach. Well, not that different, but a different approach. Let's rationalize the denominator. That is, get rid of the square root of negative 1 in the denominator. So, what is the inverse? Well, it's actually just the reciprocal, or 1 over z. Let's multiply 1 over z by 1. Specifically, let's multiply by the complex conjugate over the complex conjugate. Well, 1 times the complex conjugate is the complex conjugate, and if you remember, z times the complex conjugate is the absolute value of z squared which is exactly the same formula we just found explicitly. So, for example, what is the multiplicative inverse of 0 0.2 plus 1.1j? Well, let's just calculate it as 1 over that expression. Let's multiply by the complex conjugate over the complex conjugate. Applying FOIL, we can calculate the denominator the numerator is just the complex conjugate, and that simplifies to 0 0.16 minus 0 0.88j. And of course, if you multiplied 0 0.2 plus 1.1j by that expression, you will see that that does indeed equal to 1. Finally, let's take another approach. If z is equal to the magnitude of z phase theta, then the inverse must be some number of the form r phase phi. Well, that number r phase phi must be a complex number such that the product of z and its multiplicative inverse, or this product here, which is equal to the magnitude of z times r phase phi theta plus phi, well, that must equal 1. But 1 is 1 phase 0. For this to be true, z times r must equal to 1, and theta plus phi must equal 0. Well, solving for r and theta, it's not that hard. r is 1 over the absolute value of z, 
and phi must therefore be negative theta. Thus, the multiplicative inverse of z is a value that has 1 over the magnitude of z phase negative theta, which makes sense again. Remember, previously we did see the complex conjugate there. So for example, if z is equal to the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2j, that's actually equal to 2 phase pi over 4. Then the multiplicative inverse has a magnitude of 1 half phase negative pi over 4. Let's check. If z is equal to the magnitude of z phase theta, we have two formulas for the multiplicative inverse. The multiplicative inverse is the conjugate over the absolute value squared, and we have this other formula that it is 1 over the absolute value phase negative theta. Are these the same formula? Well, remember that the complex conjugate of z is the magnitude of z phase negative theta. So the complex conjugate over the magnitude squared is just 1 over the magnitude squared times the magnitude phase negative theta. Well, we're just multiplying the complex number by a real positive value, so we're just multiplying the magnitude by 1 over the magnitude of z squared. That's that expression there. And oh, wait a second, we can cancel out one of those absolute values. So the result is 1 over the magnitude of z phase negative theta. Thus, given z is equal to alpha plus beta j, or z magnitude of z phase theta, we have that the inverse is this expression, which is equal to this expression, which simultaneously is equal to this expression here. Now, a geometric interpretation of the multiplicative inverse is the angle is that of the conjugate, and the magnitude is 1 over the magnitude of the complex number. So here we see two complex numbers, z and w. Both have magnitude greater than 1. The complex conjugate, the inverse of z, will be below the real axis, and the inverse of w will be reflected above the real axis. So here we see the multiplicative inverse of z and w. You can see that the angles are equal but in the opposite direction, and the magnitudes are inverted. Here are two examples where the magnitudes of w and z are less than 1. So consequently, we expect that the multiplicative inverse of z is pointing up and to the right a little, but with magnitude slightly greater than 1, because it looks there as if it's about 0.9, so the inverse of 0.9 is about 1.11, and w is a lot smaller, it looks a little bit more like 0.4, so it will be stretched to 1 over 0.4, or 2.5. So there we see the multiplicative inverses of w and z. Theorem. The inverse of the inverse of z is z itself. Well, this is actually really easy to prove because the inverse of the inverse is z is that number such that if I multiply z inverse by that number, I get 1. But I already know that if I multiply z inverse by z, I get 1, and therefore the multiplicative inverse of z inverse must be z. Theorem. The inverse of the complex conjugate of z is equal to the complex conjugate of the inverse of z. So to prove this, I'm going to multiply z star by the right-hand side. But remember that the product of conjugates is equal to the conjugate of the products. So that's equal to that expression there. 
but z inverse times z is equal to 1, and the complex conjugate of 1 is equal to 1, so then yes, the inverse of z star is the conjugate of the inverse of z. Theorem. The magnitude of the reciprocal of z is the reciprocal of the magnitude of z. Well, proof. Well, the inverse can be given by this expression here. It's the magnitude of z star over the magnitude squared. But the magnitude of a product is equal to the product of the magnitudes. In this case, it's a division. So now it's the magnitude of z star over the magnitude of z squared. But the magnitude of z star is equal to the magnitude of z. We can cancel out one of the magnitudes, and therefore we get that, yes, indeed, the magnitude of the inverse is 1 over the magnitude of z. Theorem. The inverse is equal to z star if and only if the magnitude is equal to 1. Well, as shown, the inverse is already the expression z star over the magnitude squared. So if z star over the magnitude squared is equal to z star, that can only be true if the magnitude squared is equal to 1. And because z is great, the magnitude is greater than or equal to 0, therefore the magnitude squared is equal to 1 if and only if the magnitude is 1. What that means is that the inverse of any number that is on the unit circle of the complex plane is another complex number that is on the unit circle. In fact, the complex conjugate of that number. So in this topic, we've introduced the multiplicative inverse of a complex number. We've used three different approaches to find three different formulas, and all three formulas were found to be equivalent. We saw, saw that the geometric interpretation of the multiplicative inverse was that complex number that had 1 over the magnitude of the complex number and the angle of the conjugate of that number. Finally, we saw a number of properties of the multiplicative inverse. Here are some references, acknowledgments, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!